Well, thank you for, very much for the introduction, and thank you, everybody, for coming out. Um, this book, The Life and Times of Hannah Crafts, is about the, the substance of the, the book is important, but also obviously very important, but the making of the book is in, as important as well. How did you get involved in all of this? Well, tell the story of your, con, your discovering and connection to Hannah Crafts. Well, thank you so much. I, I have to say, and this is not a small thing, this is a really important moment for me to be on stage with Annette, whose work, before I ever even got involved, and it really is meaningful, um, before I ever got involved with this, Annette's work on Sally Hemings and the way you did that historiography and brought not just her story, but the Hemings family story to us. It was, and, and, the, and the way you managed to tell the story helped me. So before there was even a subject, I, there, I needed a model, and, and it's such a pleasure. And the, the well, thank gods you. were smiling on me to bring <laughs> us together today. Um, so in 2002, I took a job at Eastern um, Carolina University. So uh, that same year, I arrived in Greenville, North Carolina, in the eastern part of the state. Henry Louis Gates Jr. had discovered and published a novel called The Bond Woman's Narrative by a woman calling herself Hannah Crafts. And like the best-selling audience it drew, I was just one of the readers who was completely captivated by the story. Um, I have always been fascinated by archival research, and there's nothing that I've enjoyed more as a scholar than to spend time in the archives. And so when that novel was published, and I happened to be in the closest university, major university, near the location where Gates and others had identified the author likely came from, I thought, well, I might want to dive into this story. And I got an email from an, an important collaborator of Dr. Gates's, um, a wonderful scholar named Hollis Robbins. And she asked me to start digging into the archive at my university. And that was the beginning of a 20-year friendship between me, Dr. Gates, and Hollis Robbins. And all along, like the starting work that Annette did, this project is collaborative. So I couldn't have written any of this if I didn't have, spend the time and build the connections in the descendant communities related to the author. Um, and that's descendant communities from both enslaving families and those who were enslaved. And that took, um, it took time and just passion and a uh, presence, humility, and just a deep, deep, um, fascination with trying to get at what I first experienced when I read the book was just this genius, this uh, artistic genius. I wanted to know more about it. So mm -hmm. that was the initial foray into it, and then it was the work from there. Okay, so you identified a number of things here. There's archival research, there's things on paper, yes. but you actually talk to descendants, people who right. would have had stories about all of this. I'm just Curious, had you ever done anything like that before? No, and um, I, I had, my earlier work was um, in British literature and I've been- Oh, wow. I, the archi <laughs> yeah, the archival work was not complicated for me. What was new to me was doing the um, sort of anthropological, you know, work of working in, or working in um, a tradition of oral history and talking to, you know, like a journalist would to uh, um, people in communities. And that was, so rich that that opened uh, the friendships I made, the knowledge I made. I, I, there's even, and I never knew that I would absolutely find the author or be able to tell the complex story, which I'm very grateful. At. It wouldn't have mattered. Just the uh, possibility to harmonize myself into the history of the world that I was living in, mm -hmm. right? So if you're in Eastern North Carolina, and you're in these towns, like you are any place, the names on the signs, the landscape, the riverways, the geography, the current spirit of the place carries that history. And to be, to be gifted with the ability to, as a literary scholar, to then invest yourself fully into a story in the world that you live is ex extraordinarily uh, exciting. And it did take um, a, a little bit of a learning curve 
to to do that work. Like the first night, the, the I, I knew I wanted to speak in these smaller communities. So there's a little town called Windsor, North Carolina. And I arranged to talk at the community center there. It's a Friday night, not a lot going on, you know, in a, in a small town. So the community shows up. And um, that first night when I got on stage, I pronounced the name of the, the county wrong and everybody in the audience erupted. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, so, and that was good because they thought that a lot of times outside of the academy, they think that, you know, like I'm an English professor, so everybody's on guard that I'm gonna catch their grammar mistakes. Yeah. Was, you know, I have dangling participles that my editors were saving me from the whole time I'm doing this. So in that community, that uh, I'm saying the humility and sort of disarming people, I didn't come, and this is the other most important thing, I didn't come in with an, well, like I had the answer. It was really intensive listening, right? So I, after I'm making these initial com, um, connections, people invited me in their homes on a Saturday morning, mm -hmm. right? Um, or into their basement. And I'll, I'll give it one quick example and stop there. Um, there was a family who con con connected with me. The original person was in Texas. Their family had grown up in Murfreesboro and they believed they were connected to the Wheeler uh, family who were the enslavers. And I drove, I was really excited. I drove, I went into the wood panel basement. There are four generations of the family sitting there and they're telling me their stories. Mm -hmm. And I'm recording all this and building an archive. If, a little way into it, it was clear they were connected to the Whittier family and not the Wheeler family, but mm -hmm. it didn't matter. Mm -hmm. What the, and you know, I never even told them that the way I'm, I'm pursuing the Wheeler family because I wasn't there I was just there to intensely listen and really understand that history. And I'd never really write up anything from that interview, that day long interview, except that it, it informed me as much as anything. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was that kind of work that wasn't a traditional scholarship, but there's this extraordinary talent and knowledge that's outside the academy that um, is is, is the way you do this kind of work, which you know, <laughs> right? And that uh, your work on Sally Hemings was a model for how to do this. Uh -huh. So was there reticence on the part of the, the actual people connected to the wheelers? I mean, was there a difference between say the whites and the blacks and the way they approached you or or dealt with uh, the project that you were working on? Yeah, there, there, was a, there is a difference. So um, I remember in some of the early work as I was uncovering the, the, hor the you know, the, the demon, de there was this idea in the Wheeler family, and it was, and it, it was the way in which it's presented in the white community in Murfreesboro, that the Wheelers manumitted their slaves and sent them to Liberia, and that there were just these generous, good people. And I found it's misindexed. You can't Google it or go to Ancestry, but it, because it's misindexed. But um, in Fort Worth, Texas, there's a record of a slip uh, of slave ship manifest that has the Wheelers selling. 28 enslaved people in 1836, about half of their property. They did not manumit their slaves. So when I would do this- so, kind of, Excuse me, I'm yeah. sorry to interrupt you. You mean they just made up a story? Yes, yeah, it was, it was the story passed down even in the official history of North Carolina. So where that story started was the nephew of John Hill Wheeler who enslaved Hannah Crafts, she escaped from him, his nephew and John Hill Wheeler were both historians, and they wrote the textbooks that North Carolina chose to teach North Carolinians for 100 years, the history, and they both specifically said that they manumitted their slaves. They did not. I mean, it's, it's provably not true. And the, that history was accepted in the white community. So back to the question, when I would sometimes present this research, it was a balancing act because I could see some white descendants get really red in the face about that history. And um, even as recently as the book's publication, and when I presented in Eastern North Carolina, I w I've been concerned about that all along. But I have to say, I had to um, really understand that some of it was just a lack of knowledge in the contemporary day. They wanted to believe it. They didn't want to dig to know anymore. The white community, very comfortable with that story. So if you go to Wheeler House in the time that I've been working on this book, historians, a white, very important Eastern North Carolina historian, helped them recreate 
the curtains, the tapestry, the textiles, what was in what room. I mean, just incredible. But they told no story of the enslaved people. You know, because yeah. this, is, this is where you were pointing and, and your work does so well with Monticello. So the other side was um, getting the stories from uh, descendants from enslaved people. Uh -huh. And that, that, was a, that was important. Like, you don't come in, I'm white, right? Uh, if, if there's any sense that I'm trying to extract or co-op, a history for some personal gain, there could be nothing worse than that, right? And anthropologists know this about the ways in which you have to go into community. So the way to engage that is um, humility and presence in intensive listening until you build trust. And, um, and I'll, one quick story from that side that was so extraordinary, Albert Bishop i have been in these communities for a long time and built up trust among the African-American communities in Bertie County. And Albert Bishop came to a talk of mine and gave me a record that his family had discovered. In 2004, vagrants had broken into the, um, the family's great-grandmother's house and found a notebook and discarded in a trash pile. The two family members came to clean the graveyard of their family there in Bertie County, and they found this notebook. It was written in 1956. She had told stories in um, the family history about her father who was enslaved and her grandmother who was enslaved. People knew the story orally, but it was starting to be lost a little bit among the family. And then in 2004, they found what she had written back in 1956 when she was still very, very healthy and had her memory intact. But it, it had disappeared and then it showed up. Like, so this history that, and that history was really important because you have, that history is occurring on the property right next door to where Hannah Craft was um, enslaved as Hannah Bond. And you get a sense in the story that she shared that passed down through these families of the um, sexual abuse and rape that was a part of the story she ends up writing in the Bond Woman's narrative. So these things all had to take time, presence, intensive listening, and humility to, to gather those stories together. Uh -huh. Well, she's an extraordinary person. Could you tell us a little bit about sort of a synopsis of Hannah Bond, Hannah Craft's life? Yeah. Who is she? Certainly. So Hannah, she was born as Hannah Bond in 1826. She was um, she was the product of rape of her mother, who was called and listed in uh, slave records as Hannah Sr. Um, that original family I was able to trace back to Jamaica through the Pew family, who had imported um, enslaved people into the specific community of Indian Woods where this family was based. This is where Hannah Crafts was born in 1826. In the novel, she describes uh, local Quakers helping her steal literacy. Now, I couldn't demonstrate that there was a specific Quaker family that I was able to discover in the community that did that, right? This is what she describes in the novel. What I do know is that this young woman, um, the records show that she did have a child who died shortly after it was born. It shows up in the records. And then she was handed off. Her mother was sent away to Tennessee when she was nine years old. And then she was trafficked to a nephew of her enslaver. Likely her father was Lewis Bond. What was going on in that notebook that was on, happening on the plantation next door was the ways in which in that community enslavers would rape. They would choose one enslaved person and, and that would be a victim of rape. And they would have children among, with that particular enslaved woman. This is where Hannah Kraft's origins were with her mother, Hannah Sr. She's moved away. Hannah's in the family. She seems to have gained literacy. And then she ultimately ends up in the Wheeler family through the Bond family, through one of the, uh, this, one of the daughters of Louis Bond. Why this is really important, why it's so interesting is the Wheelers lived right adjacent to Chowan Female Baptist Institute. And in the Wheeler family records and their, their account books of Samuel Jordan Wheeler, who was who ultimately married into the family that Hannah descended through, um, they boarded college students on their property. So Hannah Crafts, between 1852 and 1856, served these college young women on this campus. 
And one of the things that I do in the book is look at the composition exercises that I was able to uncover through the records that were kept by those young women's families to find echoes in the novel. Um, she was learning and building her literacy in a documented way through her service. Her already high achieving literacy sprouted between 1852 and 1856. What's so extraordinary about that is we have in the Bond Woman's narrative a manuscript that passed down to us. It's a holograph manuscript. We have nothing like this. This is the working copy that she used to write her novel. It wasn't cycled through some abolitionist machine. It wasn't edited by a white hand. It's what she wanted to make of her autobiographical life as a novel. And that novel reflects that history that I just told you about in Bertie County, and it, and it reflects her experiences in the community of Murfreesboro and her education that she was um, in some ways stealing, but also acquiring uh, when she was serving these college women in Murfreesboro. And you mentioned in the book, you talk about her connection to Dickens. Yeah. I mean, that that was, took me by surprise. That wouldn't have been something that I would have thought, but I mean, people, authors do that. I mean, you have influences. You read things and you like the way people present things and you take things from them. That's and right. so this is something we can we can sort of credit Dickens in some way as being an inspiration. How did that work? Yeah, so this is where teaching is really important, right? So, um, and I think sometimes our encounter of literature gets standardized by the way in which it's disciplined in the academy. So, you know, if you're American literature scholar, you're going to read American literature. Well, that's not how people in the 19th century, they would read, they read plenty of British novels. Dickens was extremely important. Yeah. Um, so what, what I was able to discover was a specific teacher at this Chowan Female Baptist Institute believed in recitation exercises. And I have one of the young um, women from that community is writing out Charles Dickens' Bleak House as they're practicing it on that plantation where Hannah Crafts is serving, mm -hmm. right? Dickens and um, um, Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin were two pieces of very popular literature that were really circulating in a profound way while Hannah was in Murfreesboro in 1852 and 1856. So something that stumped scholars is why is there so much borrowed and so much um, literary influence from Dickens. And what it is, what I, what I got to with teaching, when I taught a, a slave narrative class where we ticked off the sort of works that you would read in most slave narrative classes, we included Charles Dickens' Bleak House. And if you just read Harriet Jacobs' um, Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl, and you have your mind of Jacobs and that perspective, and you pick up Dickens and start reading it from an enslaved woman's perspective, the first character you're going to feel simpatico with is Esther Summerson, who's born of an unspeakable sinned relationship, an unknown father whose name won't be said. She seemed to be somehow lower, somehow marked as uh, an outsider. And what is so fascinating, when Hannah Krauss wrote her novel, The Bond Woman's Center, this holograph manuscript, she was using her own literary genius to channel that figure, but not as Dickens would write it, as a white author from London, but as an enslaved woman in Bertie County and Murfreesboro would write it. And, and this is the beauty of literature, right? The, the literary dialogue between those brings this presence and artistry that you can study as an English professor and, and take pleasure from in seeing how she works her sources to enrich her own personal story and the story of the other enslaved women that she tells mm -hmm. in the Bond Women's Narrative. Well, that is the, the beauty of literature and the universality. Yes. When someone really gets it, when he's writing in a way that human beings who are ostensibly completely different in a completely different world see something, see something of themselves in yeah. that particular story. And so That's it's right. not just about a story of a black person, a story of a white person. If you're writing it the right way, if you are yeah. a Dickens or someone like that, you achieve this kind of thing where people can borrow from it and, and transcend it and make something of, of their own from yeah. it. And then there's, I, I want to say, there's something so fascinating about Dickens too, because I love Dickens, but Dickens was a racist. Yeah. So 
Um, I mentioned this in the book. Dick, there's this um, weird moment in Charles Dickens' life where he read, um, uh, incident, I'm sorry, Frederick Douglass's narrative, and he was profoundly moved by it, but he was disturbed by the frontispiece, of, which we all know. I mean, um, uh, Frederick Douglass was having his picture circulated more than anyone else in the 19th century because just the genius and beauty of his physiognomy broke down all the crazy racial science that yeah. was trying to be loaded onto it. Well, when Dickens tore that out of his own copy and sent a copy to his friend Charles McCready, famous actor um, who was coming to America, he was intuiting his own limitations as an off author. Mm -hmm. I write about this in the book. Dickens famously would have a giant mirror and he would go into the mirror and become his characters mm -hmm. as he was writing the dialogue and doing it. It's just genius. But what he couldn't do, he couldn't imagine himself as Frederick Douglass. He couldn't imagine himself as African American. So Dickens, the great genius, right, from England, couldn't do things that Hannah Crafts, she could see into him and see herself, mm -hmm. but Dickens could never see into her or Frederick Douglass and see um, himself. Um, so this, this power that comes through her novel lifts Dickens, right? Yeah. It lifts this earlier literature and there's a reason. It wasn't just luck or the fact that Henry Louis Gates Jr. is the most charismatic man on earth. That became a bestseller too because it's a brilliant novel and students love it. Yeah. She transcends it. That's what I meant. That's she right, yes. takes it and makes it something, That's right. something completely different. Now, just as you mentioned Douglas, there are a lot of people, and there are a lot of people today, who still don't believe that he wrote the things that he wrote. David yeah. Blight said that, you know, when he was working, before he was working on the book, and during the time, people would say, well, who really wrote that? Yeah. And these are modern people asking yeah. this story. Did she encounter that kind of thing? Did this work, her work encounter that kind of skepticism it did. from people? Uh, it did, and I think, so when Dr. Gates discovered the novel and published it and, and brought to bear his own genius and the work of forensic scientists who could really um, narrow down and, and demonstrate that it was almost certainly, but they couldn't find the specific historical figure, there was a backlash. People, and I know that Dr. Gates is a good friend, as he used to so many people, he's just such a generous guy, but it, it was very hurtful to him that the, uh, the even academic public would not accept that this was written by a black woman, which was just really a racist response. Um, and it, he knew, um, Dorothy Porter Wesley, who first collected the manuscript, great, famous, essentially important American who preserved African-American history at a time that Ameri white Americans were trying to burn it down. Um, they knew this genius was there, like these people who would uh, question Frederick Douglass. And I think the general public who read the Bond Woman's narrative made a bestseller really believed it. Mm -hmm. It was, but there were still skeptics and the skeptics have persisted. And I would not be surprised. Like there's, you know, I haven't seen a review yet that's like, this Hekmovich has it all wrong. This was not written, you know, despite all his research, right? There still is that skepticism and that's, um, it's, it's wrong-minded. It's to miss the half of the story, right? Like we don't, we can celebrate Dickens, but we get, we need to understand this fuller world, right? That uh, an, a genius early African-American author like Hannah Crafts was able to um, write in her novel. But nobody said that to you. Nobody, no, not yet. No, no one yet. yet not said yet. That to you. But yeah. it's tougher, right? So earlier on in 2002, there was not a historical person. There's not a 425-page detailed historical analysis mm -hmm. that's saying, in a very entertaining book too, um, <laughs> that that is exploring that question, right? But I do want to say this: what Gates and the specifically Dr. Gates and early scholars did is they invited skeptics in too. This is the way research works. He didn't write a screed against anybody who was challenging that idea. He incorporated the skeptics into a, a collection that he edited with Dr. Robbins. And the skepticism was really important for me discovering, you have to knock down all the reasons that somebody's saying it's not so, well, right? what, well, So what were the reasons? So, Is it you just think that people, once you learn how to read, 
right. right? And you're reading other people's work and, and you, you have models and you are, you know, a, a thinking person. I mean, what did people say? So I, the most damn you didn't have formal. The, you yeah, didn't have that, to have formal the first education. question was: there was no way an enslaved woman could have been so elusive and so clever with earlier literary sources. And you even had important Americanists and white Americanists, I have to say, who said this is not possible. Um, but the most profound and important historical argument against it was right. Gates was on the wrong, he, well, he, had, he thought Hannah escaped from the wrong place. Okay. He had a plantation in Lincoln County, North Carolina that John Hell Wheeler also owned. And when Crafts, when Hannah Bond, well Crafts um, describes, because she takes, she's born Hannah Bond, she renounces that paternity, calls herself Hannah Crafts, so that's why I always call her Hannah Crafts. When Hannah Crafts writes the novel, she describes the vegetation of the plantation and what this really um, skeptical historian said is none of that exists in Lincoln County, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. But it does exist right where the, the Wheeler Plantation was, straddling um, um, Northampton County and, and um, the county that um, Murfreesboro's in, Hertford County. Uh -huh. So the, the impossibility comes from sort of physical That's things right. that people, that turn out to not to be right. Can you right. explain more about that? I mean, what? Yeah, so. Uh, the, how you're different from. Yeah, so from what's what really important. Doing. So, and this is where the, the strongest critique, Thomas C. Paramore, a really um, cherished North Carolina historian uh, who's written on Nat Turner and other folks, and uh, he's a good scholar. Um, he, he just said there's no way this person came from Murfreesboro. And what he cited is there's a time where the, um, in the Bomb Woman's there they talk about orange trees, lemon trees, pomegranates, and even some rice. And he's like, that does not happen in Lincoln County where you're placing it, there's no way. Now it just so happens that Thomas Paramore is the historian who helped Murfreesboro recreate precisely the furnishings, the draperies, the carpets, everything about that house except for the enslaved people, mm -hmm. right? So uh, uh, there, and then there was, I think he, I, and I just think he couldn't see it because his generation of historians just didn't want to, they, they couldn't see that history. I um, he comes from a Southern family, his family. So that, that critique. You couldn't see, they couldn't see it because they didn't see black people. Yes, yeah. Pretty much. So what you do as a, as a contemporary historian is it's a good idea to go back to the last generation of historians and dig into their papers. Because in this case, Paramore's papers, which I worked through, I go to the original sources he wrote about and he would ignore the enslaved people that are, you can see in the margins, like they're, they're in the historical source records, but that generation of historians left them out. And if you build off of just the last generation of historians, you don't know whatever ideological forces are pushing that history that, that could potentially be lost if you don't generate again uh, the fresh understanding you have from, you know, I have from reading Annette and growing up as I did with this generation of just amazing African-American women historians who completely have changed the field. And, I, you know, when you write a book like this, it's not, I can't do the sort of literature review because readers would throw it away as soon as you start naming 18 important historians, but it's all in, it's all in the notes, right? Because that's who, allowed, that's who taught me to do the work that I'm doing so that we're refreshing what that earlier generation of white historians left out. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a matter of not seeing them. It's a matter of sort of looking for physical things that are wrong that That's right. suggest that, you know, it couldn't, it couldn't have been she who did this. Yeah. And um, an understanding about how people acquire yes. learning and literacy and so yes. forth, that, yep. that that made people, she didn't have that. And so therefore it's not possible. Therefore it was not possible for yeah. Douglas either. Right, so if, so I knock down Paramore's historical arguments, right? Then I need to knock down the important Americanist who's saying this sort of literary analysis could not be managed, this sort of gifted literary de devices couldn't be managed by an enslaved person. Well, in the histor historical records, I found that John Hell Wheeler is bringing Hannah to 
blackface minstrels, these are a type of really entertaining um, event for white racists who love to see white people black and cork, black in their face, and then mock enslaved people. It, it's so re reprehensible now, but extraordinary. It was unpopular among w white people for, for a long time. John Hill Wheeler in his records was going to these, and I was able to uncover as a researcher, he writes about one specific performer that he loved. And this specific performer worked for a company whose great innovation was taking Uncle Tom's Cabin and rewriting it as a deeply racist text. So Hannah Crafts was sitting, documented, in the balcony watching, for while she's attending on the Wheelers, watching the Wheelers enjoy Uncle Tom's Cabin completely reformed as Uncle Tom freezing to death in the north and wishing he could go back to his sweet plantation home where life was good. So this is the thing that the, the Americanists didn't believe. How could she write a scene where Mrs. Wheeler powders her face and Hannah in the, in the novel puts a smelling bottle under her face and her face turns black? Mrs. Wheeler's face turns black and she begs for a government appointment. And the idea was, how would an enslaved person come to such a literary performance? Well, she's there, right? She is a gifted artist. People are artists. Just because you didn't go to a university or you don't have a lot of money doesn't mean that you can't be a brilliant artist. And so what she did is flip the script. Right, What she saw, she completely rewrites. And Mrs. Wheeler and Mr. Wheeler are the blackface villains. They're the greedy, foolish people in the novel. And it's just completely knockout so, work. So who wrote this? I mean, if she didn't write it, who did, I mean, did they, was there any speculation about who could have been the author? Did they think it was another black person who had more education, or did they think it was a white person? They thought this is <laughs> the earliest who, who bothered to do this and then put yeah. it away in their. So the early the early criticism was basically this is probably a white author, either that or it's not that good a novel, and they're really kind of copying plagiarism. You know, I don't want to go to. I mean, anyway. Um, so there there's a there's a cultural way that those of us in academy know still occur, where black excellence cannot be accepted. And it's attacked. It's attacked as in every way that you can attack it. And I, yeah. I'll leave it at that. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, I'm sort of reminded you're talking about um, people would ask me when my first book came out, and I mentioned the fact that James Hemings and Sally Hemings are in Paris. And James Hemings is there for five years, and Sally Hemings is there just a little under three years. And people would ask me, how did they learn to speak French? And I thought, you know, you learn to speak French by living in France for five years <laughs> and talking to people and being surrounded by servants who speak French. I mean, certainly, I mean, if you're put in that, and there were young people, too, mm -hmm. if you're put in an environment where that's the language that's around you, young people can pick up French. And much better, they would think that, you know, that, oh, they didn't go to school. And so therefore yeah. they couldn't have learned French. So it's, it really is, a, it's an interesting argument because it's sort of, tell, it's revealing yes. about what you think about the capacities of African-American people in general. It's you know? the same moment of Dickens for, he's, I don't know why he's so bizarrely troubled by this beautiful frontispiece of Frederick Douglass. He's got to tear it out. Yeah. That's still going on, mm -hmm. uh, right? It's a similar thing. So what we're, oh my goodness, uh, we're here, coming up to the point we're going to have questions from you all. Um, what do you want people to take from this? What do you what do you think is important about this book? Other than, I mean, obviously telling the story of a person who was marginalized and who managed to escape anonymity to do something pretty extraordinary. What do you? Well, I think it's just another important um, understanding of the brilliance at the foundation of African American literature uh, that we have this figure that was not accepted, but at the very beginning of the African-American novel tradition. And the work that you see later, Toni Morrison doing, Jasmine Ward doing, um, the, uh, you see Hannah doing already. So there's that. But I think the thing for me is the same reasons why I think um, her novel was a bestseller, bestseller in 2002. The story, and I mentioned this yesterday if you were in an earlier session, 
she's very careful in the way that she get, writes her autobiographical novel. The story is not a story of victimhood. It's not a story of enslaver's power. It's a story of a triumph over that. And so when she writes the autobiographical novel of herself, she herself, the Hannah in the story is not raped. The Hannah in the story maintains her wholeness of without the abuse that Hannah the novelist in fact experienced because there was a part of Hannah that that abuse and control never could touch. And that's the deep reason I believe she was creating art out of that trauma, but the art isn't even the trauma. The art is the triumph of the human courage, human genius, human uh, comedy, the human humanness, like the goodness of, of individuals. And so for me, in a world that is so oftenly disturbing, where violence seems to rule and control and racism is rampant, there's still a way that her work points us to how we transcend that, how we make art out of it, how we make harmony out of it. Um, and as you'll see, if you read The Life and Times of Hannah Crafts, I didn't just write Hannah Bond's story. I wrote the story of the enslaved people who inspired her to write the novel. So you're going to engage a whole network of enslaved people that she knew that she brought into her story. So it's that story that those earlier historians left out, that Wheeler House left out. It's the half that's never been told as historians have been working on for a while. And it's, it's, um, it's a rich, joyful story of America. It's not something that should be threatening to other audiences. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, thank you very much for that. We, thank you for this. Do we have time for questions? If somebody wants to come up to the mic. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for your research, both of you, uh, Dr. and Ed as well. I um, have done a bit of research on Bertie County, and I understand that the exchange that in, this trade was more insular there? Did you learn much about the external slave trade or people being brought in? I understand that much of it was among family members back and forth. So can you talk a little bit about that? Certainly. So yeah, well, in, the, um, in Indian Woods, North Carolina, Bertie County, as your research has uncovered, the, uh, a lot of times um, enslaved people are being exchanged among family members. Um, and this history has been passed down uh, within the uh, descendants of enslaved people. They, they know some, some of these exchanges have been able to trace it. I, I think your question was asking the trade more largely, right? Yeah, so the, great question. I, I do address this in the book. What, what's happening is North Carolina and Eastern North Carolina, this is geography, that you have pirate ships on the Outer Banks, right? You have a very difficult um, uh, navigation system to bring large ships in. So you are not getting the sort of trade access as Virginians did, um, as other parts of the United States, with the, inter with the uh, slaves coming in from Africa. What you did have was smaller concerns, usually because they needed enslaved people to work this land in eastern North Carolina to make it productive. But they couldn't bring in slaves directly into the ports because of the way the waterways worked there. So what they did, smaller ships were working the West Indies route. So there is in the 18th century, in the Pew family who brought Hannah's descendants from Jamaica, and this is, this is recorded in the history, what they were doing is a part of a, this exchange that went up through Massachusetts down the West, the West Indies, as it's called, and, and then up into the North Carolina ports. Smaller ships that were bringing enslaved people in, and then also enslaved people coming from, as in the Birdie County, people from Maryland, people from South Carolina, people from Virginia. How does um, the, this autobiographical um, 
novel compared to other slave narratives that you, I think you taught in your course, uh, in the sense that uh, I think those might be better known. Like I know um, Wells Brown, I know Henry Beard, uh, I know Frederick Douglass, of course, incidents in the life of a slave girl. How does it compare and contrast with those? It's a great question, and Dr. Yates did important work on this early on, but it's influence. So how do you tell a free story, as William L. Andrews set this out in early African-American autobiography? You tell a free story by first in the, the communities, right? When you're un, not under surveillance, the stories that you kind of tell, and then you have a record of what other enslaved people were able to put into print, like William Wells Brown, like Frederick Douglass, like Henry Bibb, these narratives were in fact in the Wheeler household. She had access to those. She was a highly literate person who was fascinated and wanting to be an author. It's almost certain she saw some of this. And um, what I do in this book, in this builds on early scholarship, it's always been acknowledged that there's a way that it fits a certain type of slave narrative form that was already there before Hannah Crafts wrote. What I think is really interesting in William Wells Brown, because William Wells Brown um, was much, he, he was very interested in, um, as a novelist, the first African-American novelist, he would gather stories from all sorts of sources and make them his own. Um, he wasn't distinctive like we are, like, it's got to be memoir over here, novel over here. You know, there's no truth in a novel and a memoir is all true. That it wasn't, he wasn't concerned about that. He wanted to tell the story. Hannah Craft's similar way, and I love this. Like, and we have this problem, I believe, with Harry Jacobs. There's still in this community, and I think that intellectual community, this idea that if you even suggest that there's narrative art there, that you're discounting the truth of her story. I don't think she felt that. I don't think that's true. But we've always the academies really held very dearly to this idea that every single thing in there has to be provable. Hannah Crafts was not worried about that. William Wells Brown wasn't worried about that. They were building the ways all people tell stories and good stories. You tell good stories um, and sometimes it takes an artistic genius that melds things that are outside of yourself. But you bring in, as Hannah Crafts in my, my book um, tries to explore, the, uh, the lives that you do know, and you give them voice in the artistry of creating a narrative, a slave narrative, but here a novel. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Well, thank you very much. You're welcome.